Hello everyone, welcome to this material characterization course. From today's class onwards, we will discuss about uh, transmission electron microscopy and we have found so far the, the characterization in terms of uh, X-ray diffraction and also we used electron microscopy that is scanning electron microscopy and so on. And then we have enough background to take up this uh, another uh, advanced variant of microscopy in terms of electron optics and also in terms of uh, diffraction physics. So, with all that background, we will be able to appreciate this microscopic technique also without any uh, problem, I believe. And nevertheless, I will re emphasize some of the concepts. Uh, uh, then and there, whether it is a diffraction physics or, or an electron optical system, wherever we, we need to emphasize with respect to a transmission electron microscopy. So, I will just begin the uh, uh, introduction of the uh, transmission electron microscopy course. Uh, what I will do is, uh, I will first introduce a very general introduction I give about this technique, what is that people expect or what did people want to do with this microscope, what are the information they get. And then I will touch upon or I would say that we will refresh whatever the basic uh, diffraction and then basic physics behind or optics, electron optics once again we will touch upon. And then I will take you to the instrumentation details, uh, how, what are the various uh, parts and then functions especially and then how they uh, facilitate the imaging system and so on. Then in the later what I will do is I will take to the uh, diffraction in TEM in much more detail what are all the possible uh, experiments one can perform in TEM which exploits the diffraction phenomena and what kind of information you get. And then I will focus on imaging part and in an imaging we will also discuss about what kind of contrast mechanisms very briefly because it is a part of a characterization course which I would like to finish in our 10 to 12 uh, lectures uh, the, the fundamentals of all this transmission electron microscopy. So, if you look at this uh, in the fundamental uh, of electron optics, I, will, I would like to look at this uh, expressions much more carefully. Uh, this kind of expression can be derived uh, from the uh, de Broglie's uh, hypothesis and uh, he showed that in an energy of the electron can be related to lambda or you can say that you know if the acceleration voltage increases you can bring down the lambda to the very small value. Of course, this, va this expression is value uh, I mean valued or you can use this if you ignore the relativistic effects and this is the basic relation. But if you, if you do not ignore this relativistic effect, then you need to go to this kind of an expression because at the very high voltage, the electron travels about one and a half times the speed of light. So, we cannot ignore this relativistic effect and if you ignore this relativistic effect, then you can use this relation and then you can approximately derive lambda is equal to 1.22 divided by e to the power half, where e is the electron volts. Please remember electron volt is the, the energy of the electron in acceleration and lambda is in nanometer. For a 100 kilo electron volt electron, we find that lambda is approximately equal to 4 picometer, which is much smaller than the diameter of an atom. And we represent the acceleration, accelerating voltage of the microscope and E v represent the energy of the electrons in the microscope. And then uh, I would like to give you uh, some very brief uh, you know uh, introduction about this images or the, the results which you can obtain from an electron microscope. Uh, normally uh, what we are interested is, is in a, a microstructure, uh, microstructure containing features in terms of you know if it is a metallurgical sample, people are interested in defects and uh, if it is uh, you know physics and then you are interested in 
defect density and atomic positions and so on. And so, but what you have to keep in mind in, in totality, uh, I mean the TEM image gives a, an average image uh, in terms of uh, the depth. It does not have the uh, depth sensitivity. So, what you are seeing in the slide is the image of an, a dislocation in a gallium arsenide, a band of dislocation threads through the thin specimen from the top to bottom, but remain in focus through the foil thickness. So, what I try to say is uh, from an TEM image, you will not be able to see these features are in the, the top surface or the middle of the surface or the bottom of the surface. So, it gives what you are seeing is in a, uh, actually a projection which we will see what I mean by projection and what you are seeing is in a, an average. You are, you are not able to distinguish whether these features are lying in the top or whether these features are lying in the middle of the uh, foil or the bottom of the foil and so. So, the TEM micrograph will not have the depth sensitivity that is one information. And, and what are the information you will get from this uh, uh, TEM results in terms of uh, crystallography? You get the basic idea of the crystal structure, lattice repeat distance, specimen shape, crystallographic symmetry, analysis of minuscule crystals, you can derive point group and space group and so on. So, this is the typical electron diffraction pattern one you can one can get from an, a TEM and this is a TEM diffraction pattern from a thin foil of aluminum, lithium, copper and these are the a wide range of information one can derive from the uh, transmission electron uh, diffraction pattern. So, another very important uh, information uh, from this you should as I mentioned that what you are seeing that there is an, uh, a photograph where you see that uh, two animals are uh, uh, standing behind one another but uh, it, it is appearing as if uh, the head of the animal is appearing in the same both sides, but which is not the true. So, the, the depth sensitivity is not uh, available in the TEM micrograph. This is a point I would like to emphasize here, you have to be very, uh, you have to keep that in my information in mind. All TEM information that we get images, diffraction patterns, spectra is averaged through the thickness of the specimen. The most uh, important information one have to keep in mind, whether it is an image, whether it is a diffraction pattern or a spectra is averaged through the thickness of the specimen. What is the thickness of the, thickness of the specimen, how it varies we will see when we prepare the sample preparation and a typical uh, uh, thickness we will arrive at and how that is affecting the uh, imaging condition that we will uh, see it in the in the coming classes. A single TEM image has no depth sensitivity. So, this aspect has been illustrated in the uh, previous couple of slides and another important thing is you may get uh, uh, very different kind of features like this you may consider that you know one may think that this is a, a kind of a second phase particle uh, and and this is uh, another uh, coarsening effect of the precipitate something like that but you have to be very careful uh, before we use these tm uh, results this could be uh, simply not at all related to the material at all it may be due to the some of the you know irradiation damage by the uh, electromagnetic radiation itself. So, unless you have a, a combination of all the you know the typical requirement to interpret the TEM results, I will just mention it when we come to the interpretation in an actual TEM results, you have to be very careful. You cannot just uh, unless you are well experienced in this uh, field, it is very difficult to interpret these results. And then looking at this kind of image, you, you can be very easily misled because you do not have 
enough supporting evidence to prove that these are all second phase particle or something like that. So, one has to be very careful about uh, presenting just a one bright field image or a dark field image something like that uh, and then talking about a second phase particle and so on which will be highly uh, you know misleading or may be completely wrong also. So, you need to have an appropriate uh, results in combinations of uh, crystallography data through diffraction and we have to prove the second phase particle through the uh, a simple uh, dark field imaging and then you have to correlate with that uh, bright field imaging and so on. So, the what I am talking about all these are different different uh, techniques which I will be uh, explaining it in due course of uh, time. So, what I the, the information I want to derive from this slide is you have to be very careful about uh, talking about the, the features in a, in a TEM micrograph just putting at the one slide. You have to have additional information to talk about the features of what you are seeing in the micrograph. Now, the, the depth of focus in electron microscope is very high which we have already seen it. I will play a small animation. What you have to look at it is this is the a simple lens and then you see that uh, in alpha and beta are the angle correspond to the object side and an image side and this crossover is uh, projected here and you can simply uh, simple geometry you can derive that alpha image is equal to tan alpha image if you incorporate I mean if you consider this triangle and this distance is uh, d objective and this distance is uh, at a small d objective and if you see this is in a beta objective and for example, then if you consider this geometry triangle then you can derive an expression like this for an alpha image. Similarly, you can do the a beta this is a distance b d image and this is an alpha image angle and this is the small d image then you can write considering this triangle beta objective which is approximately equal to tan beta objective is equal to d objective by 2 that is this distance half distance divided by d objective by 2 this is this distance this half distance you can write alpha image by alpha and also alpha sorry alpha image as well as a beta objective angles. So, what we do with this we can use this relation to calculate the angular magnification in the microscope that is m a which is equal to alpha image divided by beta objective this is angular magnification and then we can also calculate the transverse magnification which is m t is equal to d image by small d objective and which is nothing but m t is equal to 1 by m a that is inverse of angular magnification is your transverse magnification these are all small uh, relationship. So, you should uh, appreciate this you have enough background to appreciate this now and we also know that the depth of focus d image is equal to d objective by beta objective times m t square and the depth of field is d objective is small d objective divided by beta objective. So, this is the 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 relation between the depth of field and depth of focus with respect to that ray diagram what we have seen. So, you have this uh, background to appreciate this we have already discussed enough what is depth of focus and depth of field it is just to uh, give you a recap. And now, I will just show you a schematic where you see that uh, in the electron optical systems they are mostly characterized by small aperture angles leads to a decisive advantage where the image focus is concerned. So, you can see that the, the rays which are converging here and then converging there that is above and below the objective you have a, a finite distance where the image can be sharply focused that is 
in general, this schematics in general uh, displays the, the uh, very small aperture angle effect and then the, the concerned uh, depth of focus, where alpha is the aperture angle and DF that is this is a DF is the most effective electron beam spot size. For a collection semi angle of 10 milli radians and uh, DOB of 2 angstrom equation 2 tells us the depth of field will be 20 nanometers. So, the D objective small d objective of 2 angstrom if you substitute that into the equation 2 what we have seen you will get about 20 nanometers. This means a specimen of this thickness can all be in focus at the same time. If you want to see a detail at the 2 angstrom level, we need to use a magnification of about 50,000 x. Equation 1 tells us that under these conditions, the depth of focus will be about 5 kilometers. If we only need to see 2 nanometers, we can use a magnification of 50,000 x and still the depth of focus is 5 meters. So, all this uh, uh, ray diagram and the small small mathematical expressions illustrates a point that the depth of focus in an electron microscope is very very high. And then you will see that uh, the this aspect has been exploited in the at, in a transmission electron microscope uh, hardware itself where you though you will see that uh, image formation is occurring in the uh, fluorescent screen in the on the table but your recording system will be much much uh, below where you, you may have a, a, a plate camera or a film camera or it is a CCD which is much below, but still whatever you are focusing that image on a fluorescent screen will be nicely recorded in a, a CCD camera of the same focus. So, that is one uh, evidence that the electron microscopes have a significant uh, depth. So, few more remarks on the uh, depth of focus. The depth of focus is related to the depth of field through the magnification m, where capital D is equal to d m square by alpha. Compared to the object plane, the extra factor of m square for the depth of focus arises because the image is larger by a factor m. So, the ray intersections defining the image plane move m times more rapidly than those on the object plane. Rays of different angles that converge at the same point on the image have mutual angles m times smaller than what they left the object plane. So, now we will try to demonstrate whatever we have just read through in with through a schematic. You just observe that this is a, a glass lens and then this is an object for example, a solid line D1 and then see that uh, there is a small correction, it has to be you know it, the, these two lines are supposed to intersect and then diverge and it is drawn as a parallel line, it is not true, it, it has to be an intersection, but I will you assume that it is intersecting and then diverging like this and then diverging in this direction like this. So, you see that uh, suppose if you assume that uh, the uh, solid red arrow is an uh, original object and it is being imaged and what you are seeing here is suppose if you see that you know the, the, the distance d 2 is the it is a limit of the blurring image because the you know which which when you use this when you move this d1 slightly to the the distance d1 um, with the dotted line then these two rays will tra trace like this you can follow this suppose if you assume that yes this is my solid line original object if i move that into slightly a uh, position d1 then the the divergence happens and then the green ray will trace like this because of that the distance d 2 the blurring will uh, occur. And 
your D1 is because of the mispositioning of the uh, your uh, the image plane where you have one here and one here intersection. So, it is a misposition of the image plane. So, that causes a D2. So, what we have just uh, seen as a uh, if you go back you can you can just verify this that is the depth of focus is related to the depth of field through it is a uh, m square times the uh, I mean depth of field that is that we can prove here. Suppose if you have this this distance is approximately you know uh, I mean the mag the object here is magnified here approximately 2.5 times it, this is to the scale and uh, you can see that uh, if you square of this that is you can see that 6.3 d1 times the d2 that means the depth of focus is equal to 6.3 uh, times the the distance of uh, depth of field depth of focus is m square times the d1 so that you can geometrically prove this this uh, illustration clearly shows that the geometrical demonstration for the factor m square it is not m2 it is m square so that clearly shows about uh, a depth of focus now we will quickly review the uh, resolution of the electron lens uh, we have already seen this in a uh, fundamental of electron optical system uh, and just to recap you would like to go through this the resolution is defined as minimum resolvable distance and then if you consider the theoretical resolution if there is no aberration at all the resolution of any lens that is glass or electromagnetic is customarily defined in terms of Rayleigh criterion which is also a practical definition. The criterion gives as a merit in terms of the eye's ability to distinguish images of two self luminous incoherent point sources. A single point source will not be imaged as a point even if no aberrations or astigmatism are present. I will play this uh, animation for these two self luminous point sources which are trying to converge and then these two point sources will be recognized as a independent source only with the, the distance of 0.61 times the lambda that we have already seen it. So, you just recall that uh, the earlier discussion the finite size of the lens results in diffraction of the rays at the outermost collection angle of the lens usually by limiting aperture. This diffraction results in a point being imaged as a disc called the array disc. So, you remember this is an array disc which we have already seen it. So, I will not uh, uh, discuss that further which has a cross section intensity uh, profile. And Rayleigh stated that if the maximum from one source lies over the first minimum from the other source then the overall intensity profile exhibits a dip in a middle at about 80 percent of I max. So, this also we have seen. So, the, the minimum of the next source will be matching with the maximum of the first source. So, and this, this dip will occur at about 80 percent of the I max. So, this also we have seen previously. The I can discern this dip as two overlapping images thus indicating the presence of two separable sorry two separate objects. Under this circumstances the distance apart of two incoherent point sources is defined as theoretical resolution of the lens and R T H and it is given by the radius of the array disc R T H that is theoretical resolution is equal to 0 0.61 times lambda by beta. And we have also seen about the spherical aberration where C s is the a constant for a 
particular lens called the spherical aberration constant and B is a semi angle of collection in the objective lens. The resolution of the object is given by some combination of Rayleigh criterion and aberra aberration error. So, we will now look at the some treatment by Hawkes gives a particularly a clear description of how this combination leads to a value for a resolution in a microscope. So, suppose if you include the spherical aberration coefficient how it is going to be. So, this is a Hawkes treatment. Suppose if you assume that uh, we are taking a spherical aberration into uh, Rayleigh criterion and, and take the combination of Rayleigh and uh, spherical aberration disks in the quadrature. <laughs> R T H is equal to R, R T H square plus R spherical aberration because of spherical aberration R due to spherical aberration is called R X P H square to the power half. We can now thus find how R varies with beta using this relation R as a function of beta is equal to 0 0.61 times lambda by beta whole square plus C s into beta cube to the power I mean to the power 2 whole to the power 1 by half that means the square root of all this expression. Since the two terms vary differently with the aperture collection semi angle beta a compromise value exists when d r by d beta is equal to 0 is if you can differentiate that expression you will get this kind of a value. From this equation the optimum value of beta can be obtained like this B opt is equal to 0 0.77 times lambda to the power 1 by half divided by C s to the power 1 by half. So, so this is a called a spherical aberration limited resolution and for a 100 kV electrons a lambda is 0 0.0037 nanometers for an instrument with a CS is equal to 3 mm gives a beta opt value of 4.5 milli radians. So, you have R minimum is equal to 0 0.91 times CS lambda to the power cube whole to the power 1 by 4. This expression that gives the practical resolution of the microscope typically the value for the R minimum is 0 0.25 to 0 0.3 nanometers. But for high resolution instruments have the R minimum which is approximately equal to 0 0.15 nanometers. So, what we have now uh, trying to say is uh, we have already stated that spherical aberration is very important uh, uh, aberration which is very difficult to eliminate from the uh, lens. So, if you keep that spherical aberration into uh, a system and then how the resolution is getting modified that is the bottom line and these are all the small uh, uh, I mean steps or derivations which demonstrates to you what is the uh, how the resolution expression get modified uh, as well as the how the, the beta uh, angle getting optimized. So, it is that is a basic information nothing to get confused here. So, now we will again go back to uh, some of the basics look at this uh, animation what you are seeing is uh, uh, suppose if you assume that this is a thin specimen which uh, being irradiated by the electron beam and then your uh, transmitted beam will have or if, you, if the image of the specimen will have an oscillation in the intensity that is scattered electrons with varying intensity you will see ok. And also you have the incident beam, you have a diffraction pattern as well as the forward scattered beam of electrons. So, these two you are going to get in the uh, transmission uh, electron microscopy where you have a thin specimen is placed. So, what you are seeing here is scattering within the specimen changes both the spatial and angular distribution of emerging electrons. So, that is the idea you have to appreciate this 
the, the scattering within this thin specimen changes both spatial angular distribution of emerging electrons. So, that is it and you can see other schematic. So, the schematic is self explanatory. So, you have a background to understand this. So, a coherent incident beam is falling on the thin specimen when you have a backscattered electron, secondary electron and coherent elastic scattered, scattered electrons and then you have direct beam, incoherent inelastic scattered electrons and so on. So, if it is a bulk specimen, there is nothing like you see the forward scattered, I mean signals, forward scattered signals, only you get the backward scattered signals. Only the thin specimens permits electrons to be scattered in both the forward and backward directions, while the bulk specimen only backscatters the incident beam electron. So, very fundamental idea, you, you know it, but you have to, why we are saying this? Because in transmission electron microscopy, we use only the forward scattered electrons, we do not look at the backward scattered electrons. And uh, we will quickly rush through this. Uh, a basic idea again once again. Elastic scattering is usually coherent if the specimen is thin and crystalline. Elastic scattering usually occurs at relatively low angles 1 to 10 degrees that is in the forward direction. At higher angles for example, greater than 10 degrees elastic scattering becomes more incoherent. Inelastic scattering is almost always incoherent and relatively low angle that is less than 1 degree. As the specimen gets thicker, less electrons are forwarded, forward, forwarded, sc forward scattered and the more are backward scattered until the primary incoherent backscattering is detectable in bulk non-transmission specimens. So, this point you have to remember. Forward scattering causes most of the signals used in the TEM. So, the convenient definition of small angle is about 10 milli radians in a TEM. We can control the angle of incidence of electrons on the specimen and we will define the semi angle of incidence as alpha. In the TEM we use apertures and detectors to collect the collect a certain fraction of scattered electrons and we will define any semi angle of collections as beta. We will define all the scattering semi angles controlled by the specimen as theta and this may be a specific angle such as twice the Bragg angle where theta is equal to 2 theta b or a general scattering semi angle theta. So, again you can look at the schematic how the electron beam comes and this is an alpha whatever we have just stated in the previous slide you can just look at them as a a schematic, this is an alpha beam convergence semi angle and this is a specimen and then you have a general scattering angle theta and the collection semi angle is beta and this is your aperture and this is an optic axis. So, I can play it again. So, that takes care of uh, all their definitions in an TEM and uh, these are all the uh, typical diffraction pattern one, one get in a TEM and uh, you should know as a uh, beginner uh, what is the difference between all four of them. What you are seeing is a diffused uh, ring which typically comes from an amorphous material and this is a, a single crystal electron diffraction pattern and this is a polycrystalline single I mean so polycrystalline electron diffraction pattern as a ring sharp rings and this is a convergent beam electron diffraction. So, we will explain I will explain all these things 
when, when we discuss the, the diffraction in a TEM and what is the reason you see this kind of uh, a pattern that also uh, will be discussed in detail. And I am just trying to give you an introduction, introductory um, feel that what kind of uh, diffraction you will be able to uh, get from these transmission electron microscopy. So, you have uh, these four typical types of electron diffraction is possible and then they are all very powerful um, I mean information it, it gives you can derive little more uh, significant uh, uh, microstructural aspects from this diffraction pattern. So, we will go through them when we come to that section. And little more fundamentals again, uh, let us again a recap. The atomic scattering factor F theta which is elastic, F theta is a measure of amplitude of an electron wave scattered from an isolated atom is proportional to the scattered intensity. F theta depends in lambda, theta and z, it decreases as theta increases and it decreases as lambda decreases and it in increases with z for any value of theta. So, we have discussed this aspects while we discussing the x-ray diffraction. So, you have enough background for this. So, I will skip this. Which are inelastic process occur in the TEM? Process that generate x-rays, process that generate other electrons something like secondary electrons, processes that result from collective interaction with many atoms. <coughs> there is a typo here atoms. So, these are all the general inelastic process in a TEM and uh, now you recall this uh, animation. I will introduce an instrument through this uh, animation. What you are seeing is uh, an electron source first where you have the high voltage applied and then you have an anode, there is an aperture, a, this is a condenser lens and then you have a specimen, you have an objective lens and follows by an aperture, intermediate lenses, projector lenses and then final screen and what you have seen is how the electron beam comes through various apertures and lenses and falls on the specimen and it produces some signals, secondary signals and then it further transmits through some of the electromagnetic lenses and apertures and it falls on the. So, you have the uh, you are now familiar with this kind of an electromagnetic lens. We have already seen the functions of this and how they are exploited here. And also we have seen that you can look at the, the corresponding uh, light optical system where you have the condenser, upper condenser lens and you have the specimen, you have objective lens and you have a projector lens and then screen. So, you have one is to one uh, comparison with the light optical system. So, both have almost a similar um, I would say the, the ray diagram except that they are all electromagnetic lenses here it is a. So, the convergence angles alpha are so small that the ray diagrams are drawn with highly exaggerated angles and while the beam in the figure is not exactly the parallel to the optic axis alpha under this condition is less than 1 I mean less than 10 to 4 radians that is 0 0.0057 degree which is effectively a parallel beam. And then we will look at the electron sources we will start with the electron sources. This also we have seen it in the introduction just for the sake of completion I will just go through this. TEM will use a thermionic source or a field emission source and the two cannot be interchanged. 
field emission source gives monochromatic electrons, thermionic source are less monochromatic in nature. And this is the typical, uh, I mean electron source or gun design. You have this uh, electron gun. This is a Vernet cylinder. This is an actual photograph. And this is an optic axis and you have the filament here. And then you have the anode. So, corresponding anode is shown here and you have the gun crossover and applied voltage is there and we have looked at the, the, the function of this lens, I mean the electron source and it is designed earlier also. A high voltage is placed between the filament and the anode modified by the potential on the Vernet cylinder which acts to focus the electrons into a crossover with a diameter d naught and the divergent divergence angle alpha naught. <coughs> and then if you look at the, the thermionic sources, for example, it is a tungsten hairpin, the tip of a tungsten hairpin filament and the distribution of electrons when the filament is undersaturated and uh, misaligned and then saturated aligned. So, you have the, this is an undersaturated and misaligned beam will look like on the screen and, and you have the undersaturated aligned beam will look like this and this is the a saturated beam. So, we will look at this when we, you will evidence this action uh, while we operate the microscope. And this is another uh, thermionic source, LAB6 crystal and the electron distribution when the source is undersaturated and aligned, C is a saturated beam which will appear like this. This is a field emission gun uh, tip. Electron path from the field emission source showing a, how a fine crossover is formed by two anodes acting as an electromagnetic lens. Anode 1 provides the extraction voltage to pull the electrons out of the tip. Anode 2 accelerates the electrons to 100 kV or more, whichever is designed. So, again we are looking at uh, a second time, we have discussed this. So, we use apertures in the lens, lenses to control the beam current and the convergence of the beam hitting the specimen. All lenses are imperfect in so far as they cannot gather all the radiation emitted by an object and so we can never create a perfect image. The image formed after each lens is rotated by 180 degree with respect to the object. We will see how this aspect is taken care in the modern microscope uh, when we discuss the um, image and so on image formation in the TEM and uh, a typical uh, electromagnetic lens is shown in the schematic. You can see that uh, these are all the uh, copper coils which is, uh, is a, it's, this is a cross section of a, a electromagnetic lens which I have shown in the uh, fundamentals of electron optical system as well. So, you have the uh, soft iron pole pieces and this is the, uh, this is the bore and this is the uh, gap and then you have the water inlet and outlet for the cooling and this is an uh, optic axis electron optic system. The pole pieces surround the coils and when viewed in a cross section the bore and the gap between the pole pieces are visible. The magnetic field is weakest on the axis and increases in strength towards the side of the pole piece. So, the electrons are more strongly deflected as they travel off axis. So, you can see that uh, why the schematic is shown in this manner is because of this effect. 
the bore to gap ratio is another important characteristic of such lenses controlling the focusing action of the lens. When we pass a current through the coil, a magnetic field is created in the bore. This field is inhomogeneous along the length of the lens, but axi axially symmetric. The strength of the field in a magnetic lens controls the ray path. So, though we have uh, uh, we are going through this, we have already seen the basic function of an electromagnetic lens. Just for the uh, sake of uh, completion and the recollection, I am doing this. So, we will continue to look at the some of the um, instrumental details and then we will go to the uh, diffraction in TEM in much more detailed manner. So, we will continue the, our lecture in the, the next class. Thank you.